Thanks. I'm, uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, to talk to you all today about uh, some of the technologies that we're using at Google. The first point that I want to make is just to kind of lay some of the terminology that uh, we'll try to use in this discussion that we have about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So, so for me, artificial intelligence is the, the art and science of trying to make machines that appear to be intelligent. And for me, this is not about making machines that are like humans. It's about making machines that are useful to humans. And um, I think that this is something that we've seen a lot of progress in recently, but a lot of it has been driven by a newer and smaller related discipline, which is machine learning. And machine learning is really about building machines that learn. And it's the intersection of these two disciplines that's been so exciting over the last five years, where we've seen that learning to be intelligent is more tractable than trying to program intelligence. There are some historical examples that uh, I think make this kind of distinction really clear. So uh, IBM Deep Blue was the chess computer that was uh, programmed to play against Garry Kasparov in the game of chess. Um, but this was an exquisitely engineered system constructed specifically to play the game of chess, and some would even argue specifically to play the game of chess against Garry Kasparov. The AlphaGo system that the DeepMind team put together is something quite different. This is something that learned to play the game of Go through exposure, first by imitating the games of masters, and then by playing against itself. And that's a different route. That's a different path to the appearance of intelligence. But I think this is, this is the path moving forward. I do want to say, in my opinion, there are useful applications of machine learning that don't, most people don't think of as AI. Uh, and this is actually, there's a huge amount of work in this area. Uh, uh, automated teller machines, Bankomat machines, uh, have been reading handwritten checks since 1997. Uh, and that uses a machine learning system to do that task. But nobody really thinks of a bank machine as intelligent. There's a third discipline that is really important to uh, understand the relationship here, which is robotics. Robotics is really about machines that move. Now, if you walk up to someone on the street and you say, uh, robot, they actually think about the intersection of all three of these things. That's what comes to mind. Something that moves, that is intelligent, and that learns. This is still something that's science fiction. Um, right now, most machines that move don't learn, and we don't really think of as terribly intelligent. I think that there are some possibilities moving forward of having robots learn a little bit learn to move a little bit, but this is still a very small field. But this machine learning stuff, it's not, uh, this isn't just futurism. This is actually something that we're all using today. So uh, in, in products that, that, that Google produces and in, in products elsewhere, and, and really, if you want access to the world's cutting edge machine learning technology, uh, it's not in some uh, a data center for a big research facility in secret. It's on your smartphone. That's actually where the best stuff is in the world. And this is happening both through improving products and services that we've been using for a long time behind the scenes, uh, like improving search results. Machine learning is doing that. But also by adding new things, new products um, that we would never imagine. So, uh, for example, uh, we, we released uh, over a year ago now an automatic, e automatic email service uh, in, uh, in, in Google Gmail that responds to emails. And this is something that's been quite popular. And Google uses machine learning to build all kinds of intelligence, to build intelligence that, that recognizes objects in photos, that recognizes speech, that translates between languages, and even does things like help scientists, where we're doing some experimental projects where we're, we're able to build machine learning systems that can, for example, take an, uh, an easily obtained uh, contrast image 
from a microscope of cells and be able to try to predict and estimate where those cell bodies and nuclei are. Things that a trained biologist can do, of course, it's not magic, but it's something that the biologist can teach the machines to do as well. So this machine learning stuff, it's really not magic. It's just a new engineering approach, and it's not even that difficult a one. So uh, you can learn machine learning, the, the principles and the real use of it, in a relatively short amount of time if you're a programmer, a data scientist, or an analyst. But why is this happening now? Why, why is this a big deal in these past five years? And the answer is a little surprising, and it kind of reminds me of the human quest for powered flight. In the 1890s, there were actually plenty of people who had really good workable designs for flying machines, but they were stuck to the ground in that decade because the internal combustion engine was too weak. It was too heavy and didn't have enough power. But if you fast forward 10 years from then, flight just barely becomes possible from, by people who are building their own engines. And if you fast forward another 10 years, um, flight is available as an industrial thing globally. The same kind of thing happened in machine learning, but the engine we were waiting for was just computational power. We had a lot of the ideas, not in the 1890s, but in the 1980s. But those ideas didn't take flight until we had the power to drive them. And this has been realized through just the, the gradual increase in the power of CPUs, the realization that we can use graphics cards for some of this work, and indeed by companies like Google building custom hardware that, that accelerates this process even further. There's nothing funny or magic about any of this hardware. There's no special sauce in the hardware. It's all von Neumann architecture machines doing linear algebra. But it's about the speed and efficiency with which you can do these things. There are really four ingredients that, that I look for in uh, applying machine learning to build artificial intelligence, and, and computational resources is one of the ones that had been limiting for the longest period of time, this access to fast computation. But this is now a commodity. The other things are machines actually learn best from examples. They learn by imitation. They don't learn from just a mess of data. Just saying I have a lot of data doesn't help. Do you have examples of the thing that you want the machine to learn? If you want to learn to play the game of Go, you need to have a lot of games of Go saved. Good games, actually. Um, another thing that's really important is tools and algorithms. Having the basics of how these things are put together. And this is something else that was a barrier to entry to this field even just a few years ago. But as I'll mention in a moment, there are now a lot of open source projects, including one from Google called TensorFlow, that make the tools freely available. So the real missing piece, the thing that's most important, is ingenuity and creativity. Because as I'll show you in a minute, machine learning isn't a cut and dry approach. It's actually a craft. It's a creative endeavor, and we need designers, product creators, and engineers to become familiar with these tools in order to build what they envision. I'll take a moment to just explain a little bit more about a particular variant of machine learning called deep learning. Deep learning is something that's been uh, increasing really rapidly in popularity over the last couple of years. So this is a plot of Google searches for the term machine learning since 2010. And you see it over go going over this 50-fold uh, increase in popularity. Why is that happening? It's because it's this really useful technique, honestly. It's not a crazy new idea but it's a useful technique. And this is how we build products like Google Photos. So the idea of deep learning is, is really actually quite simple, which is that we're gonna try to build a machine learning system that performs actions by having a collection of small decision makers that work together, learn to work together in order to solve a complicated problem. And the idea is that none of these individual decision makers, each of which is just a simple mathematical equation, is very clever. But they learn to work together in order to solve a complicated problem. And this is why it comes from a field that was named artificial neural networks when it was originally created, because this is sort of an analogy, a very loose analogy, to how the brain works, where in the brain we have individual neurons, none of which are terribly clever. 
but this still learns by example. So if we want to learn to uh, tell the difference between photos of cats and photos of dogs, what we really do is we make a big pile of photos of cats and photos of dogs. And if they're all jumbled up, we don't know what to do. But if we separate them, the machine can learn to separate future photos into the two categories. And now, in Google Photos, you can build a real product. And I can search for my photos of Siamese cats. And the first two results are legitimate cats of the Siamese variety. And then the remaining, uh, the remaining photos that are surfaced are other kinds of cats, which, of course, are related. And this kind of thing, this seems like intelligence, right? This is the point for me of AI. This has a feeling, right? If you showed this to someone 50 years ago, you would be like, oh my god, it knows what cats are. It doesn't know what cats are. It doesn't know that cats are soft. It doesn't know that cats are aloof. It has no idea what cats are. But what it is able to do is it is able to take these patterns of pixels and categorize them correctly. And that has the appearance of intelligence, and it has great utility for us. But this deep learning stuff, it's not one function. It's a set of building blocks. And that's really where the creativity comes in. And people are using it in all kinds of ways. People are using it to generate new art. People are uh, using it to make crazy new photo filters where you can transfer a style from a painting into a photograph. People are using it to play games. So the AlphaGo system uses deep learning uh, uh, in order to, to mimic the games of experts and then play against itself. And just last week, it, it uh, beat the, the Chinese champion at the game of Go uh, uh, and has, has basically retired. But it does things that are useful. It's a good time. Quit while you're ahead. Um, uh, it's all, it also builds things that are really useful. We use these machine learning approaches to greatly improve Google's machine translation service. Just in the last year, it's come a long way. And uh, the yellow lines here are the performance of bilingual humans as graded by a professional translator. The blue bars are the previous Google system. And this new machine learning approach that uses artificial neural networks has really closed this gap tremendously. Still not as good, but getting there. People are also using it for science in interesting ways. So one of the, real, one of the big questions out in biological neuroscience is how do we measure the connectivity in the brain? Well, we can slice up the brain into little sections and put it under an electron microscope and see the outlines of the individual wiring uh, that makes up the nervous system. But tracing all of those wires would take the age of humanity. But what we can do is we can build machine learning systems that imitate the tracing behavior and then execute it far quicker. Oh, we, can we go back one? I don't have a back button, do I? Oh, I do. OK, great. Um, so this, for example, is a single neuron that was traced in an automated way. And having a, a person do this would take many, many hours. And it takes a machine uh, a fraction of a second. We're also using it to try to improve medical diagnosis. So for example, this is a, a photo of what a, a pathologist would see if you went to have a biopsy to test for cancer. And the job of the pathologist is to look over this whole image and see, find the needle in the haystack, see if there's any indication of cancer. But the doctors can teach the machine to do this very simple pre-screening and say, where in the image does it look sus most suspicious? And indeed, at Google, we've built systems that are able to do this. And we hope that this will assist doctors and make, them, uh, make their work more enjoyable and, and help, them, uh, help them help people. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there are some opportunities here in the field of robotics. It's still very small and very new, though. So for example, we have some, uh, some robots at Google that are learning to pick up objects by trial and error. They try to pick up objects, and they either succeed or fail. And this, this creates examples from which we can learn to move potentially more gracefully than if we do it in a pre-programmed approach. So this deep learning stuff, it's very hot within Google. This is a, we started the brain team, the team that I work on that specializes in deep learning in 2011 as a research project. And then you can see over the, the subsequent years a great increase in uh, its use within Google's code base. TensorFlow is 
the way that we use this in our code base. It's the real software that we use to build these deep learning systems in the products and services that you all use, and it's something that we've open sourced now. So that uh, we released the first version in November 2015, and now we're on version 1.0 as of November 2016. And it's uh, the number one repository on, uh, on, on GitHub in machine learning. Um, and this is something that we've, we put a lot of effort in. It's what we use internally, and we are, we're very proud to, to share it with you so that you can try it out and improve it also. So machine learning is already making a bunch of Google products useful, but the reason why I'm here is because there's countless opportunities. Uh, I see uh, new applications of machine learning every day that I would never have thought of myself. And I think this is part of why we want to get these tools and techniques out there to empower you all with these tools to build the things that you envision. So the final takeaways here is try to remember this, this distinction between artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics. It's machines that appear to be intelligent, machines that learn, and machines that move autonomously. Machine learning is already in real products. It's not futurism, it's today. Uh, it's not magic, but I think it might be a new tech fundamental. It may be like, um, uh, computer networking. Every engineer learns a little bit of networking. Every engineer, I think, will eventually learn a little bit of machine learning. Currently, machines learn best from examples, not from a pile of data. They learn from specific examples of the behavior you want done. Um, why is this happening now? It's not because of some you know, Nobel Prize winning mathematical breakthrough. Those, uh, those great ideas were actually actually came out in the 1980s, 1990s, but we didn't know how great they were until computers got fast enough to implement them. Making machine learning work involves or requires these four essential ingredients, in my opinion, and it's really the creativity and the, and the ingenuity, the, know, the familiarity with the tools and the ability to use them as a craftsman. That's the thing that is currently the rate-limiting step. And that's because computation has become cheap and fast. It's a commodity. You can get it on Google Cloud. You can get it on Amazon Web Services. It's fine. You don't have to buy anything. You just rent as you need. And the tools and algorithms are now freely available. And TensorFlow makes the standard tools and algorithms that we use at Google freely available. You're free to take them and do what you will or, or not. All right, that's it. Thanks. So, it's just algorithms plus creativity. I quoted yesterday Steve Jobs, and I'll quote the same quote of his today, that uh, creativity is nothing more than connecting a lot of dots. Mm. How soon before the computational power enables machines to connect the dots faster than the humans, and then we don't need the ah. human element of the ah, creativity. Ah, ah. Yeah, so uh, in my opinion, this is not happening anytime soon. So the kind of things that machines do Good. well are um, uh, the kind of, uh, something where you can demonstrate it being done 10,000 times, and then they can learn to do it the next million for you. Right? So that's very useful. <coughs> if you've done it enough times, it can continue repeating this process. But actually, the intention, the creativity, the selection, these are things that, that, that come from us. And right now, machines are actually very poor at this kind of thing. They don't really do planning. They don't really have goals. Um, even if you have a self-driving car and a perfect navigation system, you still need to decide where it is that you need to go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You didn't know that was coming. I didn't. I didn't. I did not. <laughs> uh, did not my my question to you, because I think creativity could certainly be defined this way, but I think it's problem solving. I think creativity is really, it's not about originality. It's about what is the problem and how do we go through the solutions that might solve it. When can we possibly use the, what machines do is learning to help us reduce the anxiety that actually prevents us to lose our fear of failure, mm -hmm. watching machines go through these failures to actually get themselves to excellent solutions. Yeah, so I think that, I think that you're right, that a big part of it is, is problem solving, right? This is the, the Edison line, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. 
Um, I think that machines are, are very helpful assistants in this kind of task, right? So uh, our work in trying to apply it to science, uh, I think that what we see is that machine learning in general, a lot of it, a lot of its utility is as an extension to data science and analytics. Uh, it's a natural progression of that. So still the hypothesis comes, uh, comes on the person side. The critical thinking comes on the human side. But machine learning provides us tools to be able to see, um, to see these things. And, and as far as feeling failure, don't. Embrace failure. Failure's yeah. great. Uh, you know, this project failed multiple times before it succeeded. Um, so... Uh, we only, we only learn through failure, and this is actually also true of the machines. Yep. If they do it perfectly, they, they don't change at all. It's only when we make a mistake that we have an opportunity to learn something. Um, so uh, fail gloriously. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that time I knew it was Yeah. Fun. This gentleman is waiting for you here. Yes. Hi. Uh, you touched on this during your presentation, but I wanted to ask you how high is the barrier of entry right now? Uh, so what's yeah. needed to start implementing machine learning? In a, yeah, in yeah. Practice? So I think the barrier, uh, the barrier is very low. It's a hundred or a thousand times lower than it was uh, 10 years ago. So right now you can actually go online, right? You can, um, you can download an open source package like TensorFlow or Torch or whatever look at some tutorials, and you can start running them on your laptop right away, right? They come with data that will allow you to do some classical machine learning problems. There are even uh, freely available machines, uh, machine learning systems that have already been trained, that have already been taught things, that can recognize objects and photos, and you only need to customize it to your particular application. So if, you, um, if, you're a, 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 if you're a programmer, right, if you know, it, and it, Python is great. Like if you know Python and you've had a little bit of experience in, 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 in data science or in experimental science, it'll come actually quite naturally. Um, and then when you want to scale up, then you can say, oh, well, do I need some additional cloud computing in order to make this go faster? But I've seen amazing applications of uh, cases of people hacking things together quickly that had no background in the field. I saw um, there's a, a website called... Uh, AI experiments dot with Google dot com. And uh, I, there was an ex example on there where uh, someone who had no prior ba background in machine learning built a, a smartphone app that you would hold it up to the world and it would recognize objects in the image uh, in, in, as you wave the, wave the phone around. And it had to sing a rap song about the stuff that it was, was in the room. And it'll <laughs> sing the song and flash the object to some stupid beat. And it's, it's a very useful product. Uh, um, <laughs> but it's cool. And you, know, you didn't need to get a PhD in computer vision to be able to do that. So the, the barrier to entry is really low. Um, I find this whole topic very fascinating. And I, I'd like to ask about more of the future of this whole thing. So a lot of people mm. talk about the singularity and you know, mm. artificial mm. superintelligence, the point when they become yes. more intelligent than us. Do you think that's coming? And, and no. Do you think it will <laughs> turn out well? So what's your take on that? Yeah, so um, I think that there's, uh, this is not something that's happening very soon. It's not something that's happening anytime soon, right? So uh, for me, artificial superintelligence is like time travel, where yes, uh, at a philosophical level and at the level of, as we understand the, level, the laws of physics, it's possible but I'm like not, I, you know, I'm not worried about how I'll greet the time travelers tomorrow when they show up. Um, uh, <laughs> I think it's the same kind of thing where what is actually happening today is the building of very narrow intelligence. That's the pejorative term that people use. It's a narrow AI. Um, and we've gotten very good at building narrow AIs. And uh, to me, I think it's, it's, um, uh, it's reckless optimism to imagine that just because we're getting good at narrow AIs that all of a sudden we're about to get good at general AIs, that does not follow. Um, and the idea that, well, once we get to general AIs, all of a sudden they will be self-improving and become super intelligent, that is yet another leap. Um, and machine learning systems, just to be clear, the systems that exist today, they don't, they don't really self-improve. They don't learn on, our, on their own. If everyone who knows machine learning 
goes, uh, just quits today, Friday, that's it. All the machines will stop learning by Wednesday next week, right? There's nothing, there's nothing self-improving. So I think we're, don't worry about, I don't worry about time travelers. I don't worry about <laughs> alien invaders. Uh, I believe aliens are out there actually, but I don't, I'm just not worried they're coming soon. <laughs> Same thing with artificial superintelligence. Thank you. Do you have any ethical concerns about some of the stuff that's going ah, on? So I actually think that there's really important questions for us to address as a society about how we use machine learning and artificial intelligence appropriately, how we distribute it well, um, and what the, what the consequences are for us as a society. So I'll give you a concrete example. So the, the possibility of using uh, machine learning in order to decide the creditworthiness of people to get a mortgage, right? Or the use of machine learning in criminal justice sentencing to decide what someone's prison sentence is. These are very delicate matters, right? These are things that have a big impact on people, and we need to think very carefully about what is the appropriate way that we use these technologies. How do we define fairness? How do we measure fairness? How do we combat bias? How do we make sure that these things match our values? There are, I think there are real challenges. I don't think that it's controversial to say, uh, you know, about machine learning helping me find photos of cats. It's very, there's very little damage I can do in the world with lots of photos of cats, except Hello Kitty pictures. I think that you can overdose. Um, uh, but so I, I do think that there are questions as this technology gets more broadly dispersed, and we should, we should, we should own that. We should face those challenges together. Hi, I'm Florian. It's great to meet to you, Greg. And my question for you is, if you at Google bring Google Translator to a level of perfection, let's say with an earpiece or neural mm -hmm. implants, mm -hmm. why should we or our future generations learn our second or fourth or third language? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there are a couple of things. So one thing is that I actually don't think that there exists a perfect translation. So there exists uh, a sufficiently okay translation, right? And so let's imagine that we get to the place where the translation is okay, it's good enough that you can have a conversation in a bar. I think that this might be something that's technically um, feasible. But to get these last couple of percent of understanding some of the subtlety, the intonation, things that are more difficult to express in one language, less, uh, less difficult in another, uh, requires a, a level of, um, an extra level of expertise. So, so my hope is that what this technology will allow us to do is it'll allow us to communicate more easily, more fluidly. Um, I'm an American, that means I only speak one language, it's very sad. Um, and so this is why I need to work on this technology, right? So that I can uh, travel and not be like an idiot. Um, uh, but it's still, it's still actually knowing the multiple languages is, is very helpful. And I think that, you know, the same way that, so actually, honestly, computers are better at, um, at integrals and calculus than I am. Uh, but I, I'm still glad I learned it. All right, thank you very much, Greg. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. Greg Corrado, with his wonderful presentation on artificial intelligence and machine Thanks, learning. Thanks, everybody. It was a lot of fun.